Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi everyone, just a few little comments before we start with our interview with Annie Strack. Um, wanted to let you know that I appeared on a, another podcast by Gail Holnick uh, called The Brainwave Podcast. Um, if you Google Brainwave Podcast with Gail, you'll get a list of her shows and uh, the one that I actually was a guest on. So when you finish our interview with Annie, please go check out the Brainwave Podcast with Gail uh, and listen to that interview. Also wanted to let you know that Artistic Harmonies Association have letters out to prospective board members. So uh, we should be hearing something back. The deadline for them to respond is November and we should start kicking off uh, a lot of great things after uh, around the January timeframe of next year. Um, also have a couple meetings coming up with some really fun stuff that uh, will help our artists out and our musicians and our authors and anybody else who listens to this. So please feel free to share this podcast and interview with Annie. Um, Annie is a wonderful, wonderful artist, watercolor artist. So let's get started with that. Hi everyone, welcome to Art Chat. My name is Linda Riesenberg Fissler. I'm your host. And today, I'm very happy to say that I finally get to meet Annie Strack. <laughs> so um, Annie and I have been Facebook, I guess, friends, if you want to call it friends. <laughs> you know, we kind of keep track on each other's work. And um, Annie's always been you know, very encouraging and, and supportive. And I'm so glad that I get to actually meet her today and talk with her today, just like you guys will get to know her too. Um, Annie is a honorary member of the Artistic Harmonies Association, um, and I'm very happy that she decided to join us as an honorary member. That that's really cool. Annie paints with watercolors, and uh, we are going to have some watercolor tips at the end because watercolors really are starting to interest me more and more. Um, I have watercolor markers that <laughs> don't do what I think watercolors will, but we'll get into that kind of later on. Um, and I I was telling her in the green room that at the end of her emails, if you ever uh, email Annie what comes back and as her footer it are four words and they are just so cool and I was it just hit me the, you know when I was looking at them and it's like travel paint inspire and enjoy and I think that pretty much encompasses Annie pretty well because uh, following her on Facebook I know she does a lot of travel uh, of course she didn't do that during COVID so she's just starting to get back into that again and um, Annie, uh, do us a favor, uh, introduce yourself to my listeners. Uh, it's an international audience, just so you know. And um, tell us about your art journey. Wow. Well, um, I started painting, like everyone, when, as a child. You know, I went and took art school lessons, art lessons in school, and um, didn't pursue it in college. I didn't, I I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was in college. Actually, I wanted to be a 4-H extension agent because I just thought my extension agent was just the greatest gift of God. Oh, so nice. I wanted to be like her. Um, and, and then I realized I didn't make a lot of money. I was working in tending bar, working my way through college, which you could do back in those days. You could work part-time <laughs> and pay for college. Yeah, yeah. Harder <laughs> these days, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in those days, I made a lot of money tending bars. So I thought, you know, this is much better. So I, I spent a lifetime in the hospitality business, um, managing restaurants and hotels. And then we moved. Um, there, of course, I got married. Um, my husband is a park ranger, still has been for like 40 some years and lived in the Everglades. And when we moved, we, we went to a lot of national parks around the, the world, right, actually. Right. We lived on Guam for a few years in Warren Pacific National Park. And wow. there, I couldn't get a hotel job or a restaurant job. So um, I did get a job as a buyer for a small little department store, traveling around Asia, buying container loads of stuff, shipping it back to the store in Guam, which was a great job. I <laughs> loved that. Um, and it wasn't, and then when I moved to California from there, we went to Pinnacles National Monument, National Park. And uh, I had been out of the hotel business now for a couple of years. So I couldn't, I had a hard time getting back in. But now I had this merchandising and retail management background, including jewelry, um, which I also studied in school. I studied jewelry design and manufacture when I was a student. 
Yeah, cool. So I got a job as a jeweler in California, um, which was okay until the bad guys came in one day with their guns. Tied yeah, up, no. <laughs> the end of all, all that. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill your family, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't get, I don't get paid enough for this. And uh, that was in the late nineties. And that's when I made the transition from being a part-time artist to a full-time artist, because I was like, okay, I'm not leaving the house for a while. Right. And uh, that really worked out well. And the economy for art was really good in the nineties. I don't know if you remember, um, I got into galleries right away and I had paychecks every month from these galleries because art was selling like crazy. Mm -hmm. So it was a really good time. And I stuck with it. So it's been a while. <laughs> right. And uh, you teach. Um, I do. You teach, do you teach out of your studio or you teach out of an art center or both or, or, I, and I know you travel, so we'll get to travel. <laughs> All of the above. All of yeah. the above. Okay. Yeah. You know, with COVID, I stopped doing the in-person lessons completely. This is my studio. We're in it right now. Mm -hmm. um, Beautiful. My work table and Let's see, right behind me is the uh, mat cutter and the paper and all that for framing. And in front of me is my teaching area and kitchenette. And I would have classes in here, um, but mm, I'm still not real comfortable with the COVID. Right. Um, the first year of COVID, I did summer school on my patio outside, which worked. Everybody came and they it did work. Um, but this year I haven't done hardly anything. And I'm not doing any art center te lessons at teaching or workshops right now. Um, if it's a workshop, that's different. I will do a workshop because I will bring my own air filtration machine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but, um, and I will sanitize the place, you know, for, for a three-day workshop, but, you know, to go to somewhere every week and do that every time I go is a little bit much. So I'm not doing right. that right now. I am teaching online though. Um, gosh, that really, really blossomed with COVID. Right. I had started teaching online with Artist Network University, which I think is where I might have originally met you. Um, um, yeah, I did do a few things with Artist Network, but not as much as you had going on. But yes, that's probably yeah. is where we heard of each other. Yes, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, so I did teach online with them um, for ten years. Until they until they sold the business, right? Um, which was great. So I had a little bit of uh, experience doing it, so it was really easy for me to just transition into doing online demos and online workshops. So actually, I'm still doing a lot of it. Oh, cool! Yeah, I'll have to have a sidebar with you on online video lessons and or not video, but online lessons, live lessons, and things like that. Because I kind of with winter coming up in in Asheville, it gets I mean, it's still warmer than Ohio and you still get some really great days to go out hiking and things like that, but um, it's not, you know, it's, it, you have a lot of rainy days and, and stuff. So it might give me something to think about over the, the weekend. Of course, with my luck, what would happen <laughs> is the day that I schedule a workshop will be like the best day of winter ever. Mm. <laughs> so, that's the way it always happens, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, the nice thing about the online workshops though is um, like earlier this year, I taught two workshops for Hawaii Watercolor Society. Oh, okay. So that's Great. nice. You know, I mean, yeah. I didn't, well, good and bad. The bad, the <laughs> good news is I taught workshops for Hawaii Watercolor Society. The bad news is they were online. I didn't actually go there. <laughs> right. But the good news is you didn't have to travel. So like airplane travel. So because I hear those, that's a bit distressing these days. So <laughs> but people sign up from all over the world to go but through true. online workshops, which they can do when I do an in-person workshop. You know, that's really limited to people within driving distance. Right, right. Yeah, it's um, really been kind of interesting through when I was doing some things in a Middletown, Ohio, which is where I was with the Artist Network. And we both know Jamie Markle. Um, so, you know, through him, we've probably heard about each other as well. But um, yeah, so I had done a workshop with Carolyn Anderson and she flew in and, you know, everybody was telling me when I was living there, nobody's going to come to Middletown. Nobody's going to come to Middletown. People flew in from California, you know, North New Mexico. I mean, I had everybody there. The majority of them were from out of state. The folks that were in state in Ohio didn't sign up for the workshop, which I thought was really kind of interesting, but, um, but yeah, so it was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of work having 12 to 15 people in 
I mean, I was, I, I wasn't the person doing the, the training or the teaching, but I was the coordinator behind the scene doing things. And, you know, that, that it's a lot of work to do that. I, is it as much work um, when you're doing it online or do you think it's a little bit less because it's everybody calls in and type of well, thing? Well, I, you know, the job of a workshop coordinator is, mm -hmm. I hate that job. I, I won't <laughs> do it. It's too much work. Um, I will only work, I, I don't work for myself. I work for the watercolor societies and art leagues will hire me and they'll do, because the registration, um, handling the money and the cancellations and signing people up and keeping track of the wait list and, and somebody will cancel and they say, oh, I don't want to do it. Then next week they're back in and it's <laughs> just a nightmare. So I don't do that part. But Hurting do, artists, yes. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that that's goes the over. hardest part. <laughs> Showing up and teaching is easy. It, right. That's the easy part. Right. But I got to tell you, doing it online is so much easier for me, too, because I'm not lugging my stuff. I'm not having to pack it up and lug it to an art center. Um, it's just, you know, I can do it day or night. I've done some workshops like for Hawaii. I'm doing them at nine o'clock at night because convenient for them is late at night for me. But it works. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah we it, both established we're, we're night owls. So it does work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just so easy not having to for me. If I, I don't forget anything, you know, it's not like, oops, I forgot that favorite brush at home. No, mm -hmm. it's right behind me in my brush rack. Right. And the same thing for the students. If they, they don't forget anything because it's right in their own studio. So they don't have to like, oh, you know, I forgot to bring the, um, the quinacridone gold. Yeah. No problem. It's, you know, it's in your drawer. Go get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that sounds great. So what you you have, I think, I may be wrong on the dates, but you just returned from France. Oh gosh, was that ever a trip? Yeah, <laughs> yeah tell me about the the trip to France, where you were, and 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 I'm assuming you were teaching workshops. You had a um, artists that were traveling, basically with you, if you will. So tell us, yeah, tell yeah. us about France. Well, um, I was in France for a month, the whole month of June, and it wasn't supposed to be a month. It was supposed to be one ten day workshop, but you know. Um, we started planning it. I ran into my friend, Eve Marie Salonson, who is the artistic director of Sennelier. I ran into him by accident in 2018 when I took a group to Provence to paint. He just happened to be in the same town that we were for the day, because he doesn't live in Provence. He lives in Brittany. Okay. Um, so we ran into each other on the street. And he's like, ah, oh, you know, if I'd have known you were coming to France, I would have you come to Brittany and come to our factories. I'm like, well, let's do it next time. <laughs> yeah. Let's plan it right here and now, another trip. Yeah. So we did. And we were going to go in 2020. Um, then, of course, COVID hit. So it got postponed to 2021. And we still couldn't go. So it got postponed until this year. But in all that postponing and um, people dropping off and people moving up from the wait list and then people wanting back in after they dropped off because we postponed it again, it accidentally got overbooked. So we ended up um, doing two back-to-back -back trips, which is why I was there for a month. It was two groups. Oh, lovely. And, uh, gosh, what a trip. We went, we stayed in, in um, St. Cot um, in Brittany. Yves Marie, his factory is in Sambriac. And um, we spent a couple of days touring the factory of not only Sennelier colors, which they make their oil paint, their, their gouache, their pastels, their watercolors. All their color is made in one factory. Just different days, they do different things. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting. So we actually toured the factory twice because I had two groups. Right. And one day we were there on a watercolor day when they were making watercolors. Another day we were there on a pastel day when they were making pastels. So it was really wow. cool to watch the different things get made. Um, and then we also toured the Raphael Brush Company. Actually, it was the Leonard. I'm sorry, the Leonard Brush Company. Okay. Which is another one of the brushes. It's like Raphael, but um, it's only, it's not sold in America. It's only the Raphael's are sold here. The Leonard Company is um, just a smaller factory. So that's why we toured it. So we got to see the brushes being made and they are all handmade. Wow. And once you see them, actually a person make a brush from start to finish. Once you see that, you will never abuse your brushes again. <laughs> the work that goes into, uh, and they do it so fast, but yeah. precision and, and so such careful work 
and careful measurements to make the brushes that are just so perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, rosemary brushes. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of, of yes. them. Uh, see me always as a brush demonstration when I've been around her at, at different conferences and things like that. And it is interesting watching her, you know, she's just like, like you said, they just, you know, and they're moving along with their hands and, and it goes real quick. And you're like, wait, what did you just do it? Oh, well, this is, you know, and, and yeah, when you see them do that, if you paint with brushes, like, yeah, you will never abuse your brushes again. I happen to paint with palette knives. So something that probably doesn't happen in watercolor at all, palette knife. <laughs> so, no, no, never, no. no. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to rip the paper, but so, yeah. So it's kind of like, it's interesting for me to watch her make brushes. And then I sit there and go, yeah, but I got palette knives and they're, you know, I probably have had these things for 20 years. So it works really well, but yeah. So, um, so where in France did you just kind of hang in Brittany then, or did you travel down South uh, a little bit or no, we just did Brittany. Um, okay. But we did the, the whole, it, it's a beautiful coastline. Right. So we did like um, each group, we spent a day in Mont Saint Michel, which is Normandy, actually, you know, the big right, castle. Right. It looks like Harry Potter should be there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then we did uh, Saint Malo, which is the pirate fortress. We did a day in that city. Right. And um, actually, we did an extra day because we did a plein air day of just going there with Yves Marie and his family. And we just, sat there and painted the um the boats and things at Samalo one day. Nice. Um and then we also did a, a town called Dinan, D-I-N-A-N, which is on the Ranch River and it's a medieval, medieval city. So it's more of that um Tudor style architecture and you kind of almost expect Shakespeare to come walking on the street. It was that <laughs> that era. Oh cool. And then we did a lot of beaches and seafood festivals and gosh it was just Wonderful. Oh, and Denard. Um, my friend E. Marie has his summer house, his weekend houses in Denard, which is a resort beach town. So we went there a few times and um, and they had a plein air, an annual plein air festival. And I was the judge of awards, which oh, was nice. really unexpected. I wasn't expecting them to ask me, but that was nice. So I did yeah. that too. Oh, that was cool. a beautiful town to paint. Oh, yeah. Well, I I traveled to France. We did it on a cycling tour, but we were down further. We were in the Lot Valley by Gordon. And um, I guess Toulouse was very close and uh, Carcassonne was close. So that area. That's very south. Yeah. 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 So uh, we, we cycled all through there. I took plenty of reference photos. And as a matter of fact, I probably have over 2000 photos from cycling <laughs> along the, the hot byways of, uh, of that area of France. And then we we grabbed the train and went up the backside of what I call the backside of France, um, Provence. Uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Bur uh, Bone for Burgundy, the Burgundy reason we did wine trip is what we did. <laughs> so, <laughs> we drank wine, Avignon. That's where I was thinking Avignon oh. and then Burgundy and then, um, up to, uh, Reims. So the only other person I know that knows how to say Reims correctly, Reims. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was interesting. We had, that was a really fun time. So when I heard you were coming back from France, I was like, oh, right. <laughs> yes. We talk a little bit about France, but it's two different areas. And when we were on the train coming back and, you know, and going back up to Reims, we were sitting there talking with um, two older, an older couple, which is kind of interesting because he fought for France and he was in the Navy, so he had to learn English because English is the international travel language. And um, so he knew a little bit. And then he got stuck because he couldn't think of the word, but he knew it in German. So here's a guy that speaks three languages. <laughs> I barely speak French. Um, and he asked me if I knew German. And I said, yeah, I'm Bishian a little bit, you know, and he, so he, we started talking in German. And my husband's looking at me like, who is this woman sitting next to me? <laughs> And his wife is sitting there looking at him like, why are you talking to someone who can't understand you? So I mean, it was just so much fun, but the, how the landscape changed, it was, um, you know, that Southern part of France kind of reminded me of Ohio because, hmm. you know, it was rolling some rolling hills, not a lot of mountains or anything like that. Very, very green. The light was gorgeous. You know, I don't have as much, um, I guess you say information about that part of France, Burgundy and all that, how the light is or 
how different it is um, from the, the southern part, other than just knowing that uh, that little bit about, you know, Rons, where, and of course, where we were at, since we were doing a wine tour, it was very agricultural, you know, so you saw sugar beets fields and wheat fields and different things like that. Um, we did see a World War One bunker, I think, or gun battery or something. <laughs> It was, it was, you know, all hidden and, and stuff, but it, it was, it was interesting to walk it was right by a church. So hmm. the graveyard, the church, and then where the World War One gun current or whatever was, it was like, wow. And you just get a whole different perspective. Um, one little country. Yeah. You know, about the size of Texas, I think is what I kind of figured out. Not the same shape, but, you know, square miles and, and all that. So, yeah. So, and then I hear um, you have Italy in the works as well so that's for next year i do um june 17 through 23 no june 13 through 23 i forget it's middle of june <laughs> middle of june yeah <laughs> go to annie's website you'll see all about it <laughs> yeah and um we're doing um doing northern italy and the the area is called la marche m-a-r-c-h-e and looks like La March, but they, they say La Marche. And um, so we're going to, it's Umbria kind of area. Oh, yeah, we're nice. Some day trips. We, 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 uh, we're staying in a B&B, beautiful, gorgeous B&B, and with a pool, all the modern amenities. Um, and then next door is this Ducal Palace. And it's like the B&B was like the farmhouse on the palace ground. So it's like 50 yards at, at the most. And next door is the Ducal Palace. And we're there's an art studio that we're using in the palace um, for our indoor lessons, but then we're also doing okay. some plein air on the ground. And we're also going to um, go to a sissy one day because there's this paint company called A Gallo. Um, it's a woman run, woman owned operation, and it's a handmade watercolor paint made with honey. So it's one of the top watercolor paints, even though it's a very small company. It's uh, quality wise, it's one of the best in the world. It's right up there with um, M. Graham and Sennelier. And we're going to be touring her company one morning. And then we're also going to um, make our own watercolor paints while we're there. We're going to take a workshop in paint making. So everybody's oh going to come home with a dot card sample of paint that they actually made. Wow. And um, another day, we're going to Fabriano and we're going to visit one of the antique historic paper mills. And we're going to have a paper making workshop where all of our artists are going to hand pull their own sheet of watercolor paper, hand pull it. Wow. So we have a lot of things. Um, yeah, that sounds wonderful. And yes, yeah, so quite a bit. And it, that trip is also sponsored by two of the companies that sponsor me. Hanamula Paper will be providing all of my artists with a block of paper. Aww. So everybody gets free paper to come. Nice. And Dynasty Brush will give all the artists a set of brushes. So it's almost all materials because we're going to be making yeah. paint while we're there. Right. <laughs> you get, you're getting brushes um, on the trip and you also get a block of paper. Plus you'll be pulling paper. Um, in addition to, you know, sightseeing in, in the Umbria area and um, visiting um, the usual local sites. Oh, in San Marino, there's a country within a country, which I didn't know this. There's a country inside of Italy, besides the Vatican, which is its own country. Right. There's this other country called San Marino, mm -hmm. which is in that region of Umbria. So we're going to go and spend a day touring San Marino as well. Nice. That sounds wonderful. So um, your website, so that folks can check out. Yep. It's right on my website, AnnieStrackArt.com. There we go. And um, I'll if you, you know, if you missed that, it'll be up here on the screen. When I'm editing, I promise I will put Annie's website up there so you could check out the uh, trip to Italy, and um, yeah, and San Marino. So we have to you know, have to say them separately, I guess, <laughs> since they're a country within a country, like you were saying. Um, as far as I know, I'm into a lot of cycling, and I think there are some cyclists who live in San Marino. So um, kind of interesting uh, little sidebar there. That's interesting. But, yeah, yeah the, I understand. It's very steep. It's like uh, not only is it a country within a country, it's on top of a mountain. Right, right. Yeah. So, and they, the reason why they, they live there is because of some of the mountain training they can get in when they're not on the tour. So, yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Another one I think is Andor, which is around there. 
uh, oh. close. Yeah. I, so I of that. you're right. Yeah. 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 So kind of interesting with, with uh, all of that, at least you'll be painting mountains, which is a little bit different than some of the things that I've been seeing you getting awarded, um, winning awards on is your, are they seagulls? Yeah. Seagull yep, paintings. Strawberries, yeah. 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 So were those done in France or? Um, I actually, I haven't done it. I did take a lot of photographs of seagulls in France, but I haven't painted any of my French gulls yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah, but congratulations on the, the awards. If, um, yeah. yeah. So brag a little bit. Tell me, tell me about the awards that you, you've won. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because we're going to mention that in the Artistic Harmonies newsletter as well. Oh. So I'll probably drop you an email uh, separate from this. But in the meantime, tell us a little bit about the, the awards that you've won. And I think it's been like you've won a couple in the last couple weeks, haven't you? Nothing big. Um, let's see. I got... Oh, did I put you on the spot? I'm sorry. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> Honorable mention in Georgia, Watercolor Society. Okay. Water show. And um, gosh, best to show last year in uh, Miami Watercolor Society. And honestly, I can't remember. Oh, okay. we had a couple of plein air awards recently. Yes, think, that's that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. And those were for oils, though. Um, oh, so you paint oils and watercolor. Oh, this is going to be an interesting conversation coming up on these watercolor tips. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Um, so I got uh, People's Choice, which really surprised me because I wasn't even there at the reception. So when I got the phone call that from one of my girlfriends who did go to the reception that she told me I got People's Choice, I was just really shocked. Yeah, that was, congratulations. Um, in New Jersey, thanks. Yeah. And that was for an oil painting. Um, it was a, kind of a seascape. It was um, the theme of the plein air was the Kahanzi River. Mm -hmm. And so the artist had to paint the Kahanzi River and the environs around it. So I painted um, this view looking down from the, this golf course in New Jersey on the Kahanzi and there's a salt marsh. So that's what I painted. And that's got me the people's choice that. award. That was like last week. Yeah, I remember that painting actually. So you did a really great job. So hey. <laughs> considering how many paintings I look at um, in the course of a day and, and stuff as I do remember it with the pretty colors warm. It was a warm painting. It was on the warm side, right? Yeah. It was. Um, because it was a salt marsh, it was a tidal marsh to you. Right. So um, I used, a, I, I toned my canvases a lot for oil. Mm -hmm. And so I had kind of a, a muddy brown toned canvas, which w worked out great. That's what I used for that because that muddy brown then became the, the low tide marsh. Mm -hmm. I just had to paint the water and the grasses around it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that it was very pretty. So I'm sure that's out also on Annie's war, war, um, website if you want to take a look at that. Um, so uh, the big thing I want to talk about mostly is I finally get a watercolor painter on here. I, I had Carrie um, Waller on here previously, uh, but it was with Wham. So we didn't, we really didn't get a chance to talk individual different type of techniques and, and things like that in watercolor. And quite honestly, I don't know anything about watercolor painting, except that it seems to be the opposite of oil colors. So it's interesting to hear you say that you do both because when I think of oil, you know, when, well, put this way, when I've been taught oil painting from the different mentors that I've had, it's always you work dark to light. Yep. Okay. Now from watercolor, from what I understand, it's, is it the opposite? You work light to dark? Yes. And is it because you're making so many passes on the, like to get it darker, you would use you would just, because yeah. I can't do that without warping my paper. So could ah. you explain this a little bit to us? <laughs> so, um, so with watercolor, you don't use white paint, right? Because watercolor is transparent. Right. Um, each layer, you see the layer underneath. You just layer the layers to make darkness. So there is no white paint because it's transparent. So, you know, you'll never get that white. Once you take it away, once you paint over that white paper, that's it. So the best way I, I try to explain this to my students is, um, you remember Bob Ross? You've uh -huh. all seen Bob Ross on TV. Yes. And do you remember he used to use this product? He was an oil painter, but he used this product um, when he started on his canvas called, he called it liquid white. Uh -huh. It was just a thin down white mm -hmm. um, oil paint. Right. Well, imagine that your paper is covered with liquid white. Ah. So your white is is there and everything that you put on it, you're mixing with that white. 
It's like it's a wet white paint and every color is going to blend with it. So like I tell people, you know, if you want to make the color pink, there's no such thing as pink paint. There's different shades of red. Right. You just use more water because the more water you use allows more of the white to show through, allowing that liquid white to show through. Okay. So um, <laughs> water then, kind of long way to get to this ending, your white paint is your water because the more water you use, the more of the white paper is showing through. So essentially the more white you're mixing with your color. Okay. So it's not a matter of like going over the same spot a number of times to make it darker. It's the level of how much water you use at the beginning. So the, what I'm doing wrong is using too much water, which end, ends up saturating the paper too much. Probably, well, not, not necessarily wrong, but that does saturate the paper a lot. Yeah. 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 If you, you, the more paint you use and the less water you use, the less you're going to mix with white. So if you want a dark color, use less water. Okay. Um, and then when you layer it on, you have more paint, you know, so you have less of the white showing through. Um, right. A lot, some people do build up in layers and layers and layers though, but you don't have to. If you okay. paint a la prima, okay. if you're used to painting a la prima, color, you know, direct, um, painting using less water is just the way to go because you're going to have less layers and you're gonna need less layers. Build it all up in once. Okay. Now it's also very <laughs> unforgiving because you don't have white paint. So you make a mistake. Oops, you lost it. Yeah, yeah. I've heard a lot of folks that start with watercolor. Um, that's kind of like a common frustration. It's like, oh man, I can't fix this. Where oils are very forgiving naturally. You can let it dry or you can scrape it off or, or whatever. Um, sometimes scraping it off gives you a whole nother perspective on what you can do with a specific area of a, of a canvas, which I'm sure you know. Um, so yeah, so I guess that I've seen, you know, I've walked through when I've taught at the Middletown Art Center, um, the folks who were doing watercolor. And I always found it interesting that they're starting off with pencil to draw in their painting. So is that typical or it, is it something oh, yeah. that beginners do or no, it's, it's typical, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. I do a very, very detailed drawing first. Even if I'm working in plein air, I'm mm -hmm. still going to draw my subject very, as very detailed on the paper because every brush stroke counts. You can't remove that brush stroke once it's down. It's permanent. Unlike oils, you know, right. oils you can scrape off, acrylics you can paint over. You can't do that really with watercolor. You can do a little bit of lifting sometimes, depending on one, the color, because some colors are staining, mm -hmm. um, some colors are, are less staining. So maybe you can lift it off, maybe you won't. And the other thing is depending upon the paper that you use, some papers are more absorbent than others. So some papers you can lift and some papers you can't. Okay. So what did you start with when you started painting, oils or, or watercolor? Um, well, I went to art school, so you had a regimen that you had to follow. You know, first you had to learn how to draw. You had to take all the drawing courses, drawing 101, 102, the ABC, the whole works. Then um, you had to take the value, you know, classes, just classes on value, then watercolor, then acrylic, um, then oil last. Oh, okay. Didn't let you, you weren't allowed to take oil classes until you took watercolor, uh, until you took acrylic and you couldn't take acrylic, so you took watercolor interesting and you so, watercolor until you took drawing i was going to say what they wanted to do was make sure that your drawing skills were improving all the way through those various levels of, of courses i'm assuming since yes you, that seems to be i mean it's a common thread through pretty much any um type of drawing or general whatever you want to call it i mean it is the fact that you have to have really draw you know drawing really good drawing skills and yeah. you know that there's a painting that that I've done that's driving me nuts because <laughs> I can see a, a drawing what I'm thinking is a drawing mistake and as it turns out it's more uh, um, a straight line inadvertently that I have of you know some trees trailing down and it's it's not you know a nice shape it's just uh -huh. very very straight and I'm sitting there going why is that that way and it always just keeps grabbing my eye and it's not it's not what I would call a real drawing you know mistake but it's it's definitely something that I need to fix because every time I walk into my studio, I look at it, that's where my eyes go. So it's like, okay, need to fix this guy. 
but yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, I guess watercolors has always been a bit of a frustration for me, but I never really used the actual watercolor paints. Like I said, I've got watercolor markers, which I think is totally different than my assumption is totally different than using a watercolor with that has pigment and, and all this. So talk to us or tell us a little bit about, um, I'm assuming you use the Sennelier watercolors and, um, Give us some background on um, the different watercolor paints. Why do you like Sennelier, for example? Are there other watercolor paints that, that you would use or that you could recommend for folks that are just getting started? Um, is there a line of Sennelier or something that, you know, is a starter line, if you will, like, like there is an oil, there's always the artist level, which is kind of the student level of paints before you get into the very, very expensive paints. So break down that for us, if you would. Well, you know, it, good thing you brought that up because um, there is a difference between student grade and artist grade. And you don't notice it so much in oil paints. Right. But you do notice the difference in watercolor um, because your student grade paints are not made with the same pigments. For instance, uh, cobalt in artist grade is made with cobalt, um, the metal, the, the mm -hmm. mineral. Cobalt. Right. Whereas in a student grade, cobalt is going to be made with a combination of other cheaper pigments because cobalt is very expensive. Right. So in a student grade, to keep the cost down, they're using substituting other pigments. They're going to add phthalo and they're going to add titanium white um, and maybe some other colors, maybe a little bit ultramarine to, um, to tone it down. So using the cheaper ingredients, they've got the same, what appears to be the same hue, the same color. Mm -hmm but it's not gonna behave the same as the artist grade because it's not the same actual pigment. So like cobalt, um, if, I, if I'm painting with cobalt in artist grade materials and I make a mistake, I can actually lick it because cobalt is a non-staining color. But if I'm using a student grade paint, I won't be able to lift it because it's got phthalo in it, which is a staining color. Right. So there's, you know, it doesn't re it won't behave the same. So there is a frustration. I do tell my students, don't buy the student grade stuff. Even if you're just starting out, the student grade stuff, when it comes to oils, it's not going to make a difference, but it really makes a big difference in watercolor. Buy the student grade stuff. If you already got it, give it to your kids, your grandkids. Don't use it yourself. Right. Go out and buy the artist grade. And you don't need a lot to start with. If you start with a split primary, you know, um, um, your red, blue and yellow, and a warm and a cool in each version. So two reds, two yellows, and two blues. With those six tubes of paint, you can produce every color under the rainbow. That's all you need, a warm and a cool of each of the primary, a split primary. Mm -hmm. You can get by um, fairly inexpensively with just doing that. Um, so it's not gonna, you know, cause, you don't have to buy the big set of paint. Right, right. But just don't buy the student grade. So we found something very similar between oil paints and watercolor paints. And it is that um, I, part of my frustration is that I'm not using the right material and without knowing everything about watercolor to begin with, <laughs> you know, that's as adding another frustration on top of that. Um, but yeah, it's one of the things that I found out with oil paints was I was using a brand that was more student oriented, more, you know, cheaper and uh, not as much pigment in the paints. And I'm not going to name That's the brand. Thing. It won't go as far. Even exactly. You get the right pigment. So it won't be as loaded and it will have fillers in it and more oil. So it won't go as far. Yeah. So that's another part that is the same between different oil paints. When I, I met Michael Harding and he was talking to me about all the, the paints and, you know, really giving me an education on that. It was like, wow, I wonder if it's, you know, I'm holding myself back skill wise because I can't do, and I'm thinking it's my skill when it was actually the materials that it was the, the paint that I was using at the time. And now that I'm using Michael's paint, you know, it's like everything I want to do is unlimiting. So um, yeah, so I mean, I could see and understand the difference when you start talking student grade paints and, and different things like that. And, you know, I would even put these markers that I play with, they're very good markers. I, but they're not oil, they're not watercolor paint, excuse me. Right. So, you know, it's, it, I could have you tell me all these great tips <laughs> on how to lay color down and it's not going to be the same because I'm not 
mixing. You know, I don't have that color sitting there that then I can dip water, my brush into the water. That's the other thing. So you dip the water first and then into the paint or do you yeah, paint up to you? Up to you? So you, up to you. you do you like have a little palette area that you can mix paints with and uh, all that good stuff? <laughs> well, you know what I, uh, I, I use pan paints. There's watercolors can come in pans, which is um, dried. Actually, give me a second, I'll go sure, grab it. So sure. this is my uh, old pan of sommelier that he gave me. Actually, I added to it. This was, I don't know, 12 or 24. I forget how many. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, this is my set of pans. Great. Some of these, these are full pans. These are half pans. See uh, the difference okay. in size? Uh -huh. Yes. I don't like a half pan because only small brushes fit in the pan. I like a, a even a full pan. I, I use a very large brush when I paint. Okay. So I need a very large area to dip the paint in. Not all of these are sommelier, by the way. I do have a couple of Holbein colors. And you can see these these blues here, which are mm -hmm. very opaque looking. Uh -huh. because they do have Holbein colors. Some of them have titanium white in them, which makes them opaque. So they behave kind of strangely when you use them. And I like, I've gotten used to how they react. So I like the techniques that I get with them. So I do have some, but it's mostly sommeliers. Okay. But, Interesting. Um, so anyway, so they come in, you can buy paint in pan or liquid form in the tube. Okay. Um, the difference is pan paints have glycerin added, which is a humectant. Humectant, mm -hmm. did I say that right? it keeps it moist so when you touch it it feels sticky it's okay. dry i haven't used this in two days but they feel sticky to the touch whereas when your watercolors if you squeeze them out in your palette and you let them dry they are going to be dry and dusty feeling okay. and um when they when they sit in your palette a long time dried they some of the colors will chip away they'll granulate they'll like fall apart hmm. in little bits and pieces and then they then they travel around all the other colors and contaminate them which I really hate <laughs> especially the earth tones um things like ochre and umber and colors like that your your earth pigments mm -hmm. whereas the pan colors because they have the glycerin in them to keep them slightly moist mm -hmm. I mean it's, it's just a drop imagine yeah. just one drop in each of those pans right but glycerin keeps them moist so they don't break up like that they'll stay congealed in their pans so that's why I like it also because I do plein air work mm -hmm. I do the plein air competitions and it's way easier to travel like this than any other way right so when you do travel like with oils when I travel we have to put a we put them inside of a plastic bag and then we put pigments mixed with vegetable oils so that they don't get confiscated by TSA right. um, do you have to do the same thing with uh, watercolors uh, no, because I don't travel with anything in a tube. I don't travel with anything wet. Ah, okay. Um, that's the, that's the, so I, I recommend if to travel, travel with pan watercolors, don't bring tubes. And I tell my students, don't bring tubes, only put them in a, in a pan. And if you don't have pan watercolors, fine, buy a folding watercolor palette, you know, a travel palette mm -hmm. and fill the wells with your colors, with from the tube two weeks before you travel to give them plenty of time to dry. Ah, okay. So, uh, yep, so interesting conversation or interesting tips there for travel. And I, I assume unlike, um, well, you still would have to travel with your the paper, I'm assuming. Um, right, and I use blocks when I travel, blocks. Okay. Um, <laughs> blocks. So this is great. We have an interview with, um, with Annie in her studio and she can just turn around and grab everything she needs to show us. <laughs> so this is wonderful. <laughs> so this is the okay. paper I'm using now. This is, right. uh, here we go. Here you go. Anamula watercolor. They call it the collection. Okay. And it comes in all finishes, um, smooth, uh, hot press, cold press, or rough. This one feels like it looks like it might be cold press. Yeah, it's rough. This one's rough. Okay. I prefer a rough paper. Um, it's 10 sheets and then it's got a little thing here where I can peel off. So it's gummed on all four sides. That's oh, okay. It comes. So it's, it's, um, it's my paper's ready to use, but it's also mounted to hold it flat while I paint. So I can just nice. pop this on the easel and be ready to go. And it comes in different sizes. This is nine by 12 
you can get these blocks in sizes up to 18 by 24. Okay, so, so when you're what I travel with. Okay, so when you're painting plain air, you actually have like a plain air easel that you're putting in it's it's a vertical, you're not coloring, you're not painting horizontal. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I can tip it flat when I have to do a wet wash. Okay. Um, but otherwise I do, I paint vertical and I've gotten used to, I've been doing workshops and demos um, since the late nineties. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten so used to doing workshops and demos in locations that don't have a teaching mirror that I've gotten used to doing vertical so that everyone in the room can watch. Oh, okay. So, um, wow. <laughs> It's interesting. It's just a little bit of difference. And it's interesting that I could talk with somebody who would understand from an oil side, side where I'm coming from, so that, you know, you can really get to the heart of the, the what the differences are. So um, I'm assuming that the, the rough tooth paper grabs the pigment quicker, or the watercolor quicker, whichever well, way you can say oh that. Oh gosh, huge difference. So okay. it comes in hot, which is really, really smooth. Um, cold press which is pressed without heat so imagine 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 ironing a shirt okay um if you're ironing a shirt if, if you just shake it out and hang it up mm -hmm. that's like rough paper it's going to have a lot of texture right because <laughs> it's not pressed. Right. if you press it with a cold iron mm -hmm. um it's going to get smooth but not as smooth as if you press it with a hot iron you press it with a hot iron it is going to be smooth as glass so that's basically what you imagine, you know, um, watercolor paper. It's, it can be pressed hot, which is, is smooth as glass then, very smooth paper. Um, rough is just hanging up with very little pressure. So it has a lot more texture. And cold press, that's just a little bit of texture. Now that also affects how it's going to absorb paint. Um, yeah, the other thing is sizing, which I can tell you about in a second. But first, let me talk about uh, pressing. When you're pressing hot, you're squeezing out more water, the water is evaporating as well as squeezing out. So it's compressing not only smoother, but thinner and tighter. It's going to compress very, very tight. When you do that, it's going to be less absorbent. Ah, okay. But your water and your pigment lays on top more. So if you make a mistake, it wipes off really easy. <laughs> so beginners, a lot of lifting on, on, on hot pressed paper. Okay, and that that's a smoother texture. That's a smoother, and that's now, typically you what your beginners that, start that on. Randomness, though. Oh, you know, okay. Um, one of the nice things about using a rough paper that I like. Now, if I make a mistake on a rough paper, it's not pressed out as smooth, so it's not compressed, mm -hmm. so it's more absorbent. It's um, closer to like a paper towel almost. Yeah. If I when I put paint on it, it's harder to lift because it soaks in deeper. Um, so it also takes longer to dry because it's now it's it's soaked in like a towel. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a little bit longer to dry. I also cannot lift out mistakes. I can't lift out any white, um, you know, light in colors with the rough paper. But the difference is when I do a brush stroke on hot pressed paper, because it's it's smooth as glass, I can use a one hair brush and get detail. Not that I would. I'm not that kind of painter. But you know how artists, some artists do um, photorealism? Uh -huh. That's what you want the hot press paper for because you uh, don't okay. have that texture fighting against you. So you can get incredible detail and the tiny details um, of photorealism. And you have much more control. With a hot press paper, it's got a lot of bumps. It's a mm -hmm. rough surface, very lumpy. Um, so you don't, you can't get that detail, but on the other hand, I can use a soft brush and lightly brush it across the surface of the paper. The paint will only deposit on the high spots and the low spots will stay white where the paint didn't touch it. So uh -huh. I get that sparkly effect, that more spontaneous, loose effect that we associate with watercolor painting. Huh. So there's a drawback. Some people, it's not that one is better than the other. It's not. It's personal preference. Do you want that that tight detail of photorealism, or do you want that loose, spontaneous watercolory look of um, of less detail? Cool. So, do beginners tend to to start with a smoother texture because you can teach well, lifting oh, and things? 
Then there's cold press. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> We're not cold done. Press. Sorry, I forgot about cold press. So cold press is like half, you know, it's a little, it's in between. It's got a little bit of texture to it. Um, it's got some pressure, so you can do some lifting. It's got, it's not as rough, so you can get some details to it. It's kind of like the happy medium. So most people use cold press because it's kind of in the middle. Cool. Okay. So yeah. So I guess one of the other reasons why I, I I am so quote unquote afraid of trying watercolors is, you know, knowing that seeing some people who are probably a lot more of a perfectionist than I ever would be with, <laughs> with watercolor, but you know, it's like, oh, I get to, I get halfway done, three quarters of the way done, almost done. And I make a mistake. And I, I'm assuming that as you gain experience with watercolors, you also find little tricks that you know, if you make a mistake very close to the end that you don't end up throwing the whole, you know, painting out, um, if you will. Um, so, and I know those tricks would probably be very, very hard to explain with, but is it something that you learn as you gain skill, just like you do in an oil painting environment? Like the folks that make mistakes early on probably don't have the knowledge to A, recognize that it's a mistake, B, <laughs> you know, um, have the skills to to fix it uh, like i said with oil paints it's a lot easier a lot more forgiving you scrape it or you wait till it dries and you paint over it <laughs> type of thing so tell us tell i mean is there similar stuff that happens in watercolor do you learn little tricks oh sure you learn you, you're always learning and i'm always learning you know I'm, i've been painting for for a long time and i'm still learning i'm still learning from other artists i still watch everyone else's demos and workshops to learn from everyone else mm -hmm. um, and I'm still making mistakes constantly I have paintings racks of well racks of mistakes that you know ruin paintings um, sometimes it's a mistake of the wrong materials you know using not having the color that I want so substituting and it was the wrong color because it behaved wrong you know what I mean um, behaved wrong is that you like using a color that stained when I wanted a lifting color or using um, a lifting color and then glazing over it uh, because mm -hmm. then it lifts up, you know, so there's, right. there's times when you don't want to use a lifting colors and times that you don't. Um, and sometimes the, and the, it's just the wrong paper, using the wrong paper or using the wrong pencil even makes a mistake. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about there about lifting colors. Are they labeled that way? Are the colors labeled that way? This is a lifting color. This is a saturating color. Oh, you know, mostly no. Oh, so you but have to learn this by yourself. <laughs> you do. And um, give me a second. I'm going to pull up my color chart. So sure. this is a homework assignment that I give to all my students. Ah, cool. Most of them don't do it. But um, I make them do it. And you can color. tell, can't you? It's like not flossing your teeth, I bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this is my color chart and this is every color well i'm sure there's colors that i own that i haven't added to this one yet but what i do um i use this to tell as a reminder to show myself what each color does ah. so i start by drawing um painting a black line in either acrylic or ink not with watercolor not with oil okay um, a permanent black line so that black line, when I do a wash across it of color, I'll then do a wash of watercolor across it. And if I see the black line clearly, mm, that okay, means yeah, I can it's see transparent. If I don't see it clearly, that means it's opaque. Like here's okay. a very opaque blue. Um, some of them are more transparent. So that tells me the transparency of the color. Um, and I write, by the way, I also write the name of the color and the manufacturer because like cobalt varies from different manufacturers. It, it'll look completely different from one manufacturer to another. Mm -hmm. So I write the name and the manufacturer on here, you know, as I do it. So I remember which one is which. Um, I also do a backwash with water while it's wet. I just drop a drop of water in it and let it backwash. Okay. That shows me as it dries the granulation properties. Because watercolor, you know, some pigments, earth tones um, and mineral tone, mineral pigments will granulate. And that's a, something that sometimes you want and sometimes you don't. Hmm. So that drop of water, when, as it dries and backwashes up, shows me the granulation properties of the paint. Nice. After it's dry, I take a damp brush and I do a 
Sweet. But I scrub across very lightly. I don't really scrub hard, just a damp brush, um, wet and lift. And that shows me the staining properties of whether the cut the whether it's staining, like this one is very staining over here. Yeah. Um, that one's staining in the train. This one is not. You know, it shows mm -hmm. some some colors lift and some colors don't. And then I just do this for all my colors. And yeah. it shows me everything I need to know about the pigments. It also helps me when I'm um, planning my painting to know what I'm going to use, whether I want this opaque color or the transparent color. Interesting. Okay. So basically, like an oil painting, you have to know if a particular color is opaque or transparent. Oh, absolutely. And, yes. Yeah. And the welcome. different, yeah, the different properties that come with that. If I want something that's, transparent as in see through um, something in oil painting, you have to know the properties and the, like you were saying, the gradient and everything uh, for watercolor, you have to know the properties of ultramarine blue, for example, which is more transparent than, I, I'm gonna throw a Michael color out here than the, the night's blue, that night's deep blue, I think, or at deep night's blue, something like this. Three, I know it's those three words. I just don't know which order it's in. I don't use it very often in, in my defense. Um, and it's not something that Michael did. It's I don't use it very often. With that that night's blue is more opaque and mm -hmm. than the ultramarine. And I have to understand how that's going to work when I'm mixing. And I guess with watercolor, you, the mixing happens on the paper, or does it happen also on your palette? You know, that's up to each of that, you know, again, up to every each individual artist, whether or not you want to mix on the paper, a la prima, or in layer, mm -hmm. or whether you want to pre-mix. I prefer to layer my colors rather than mix them. Um, I think because when you layer your colors, let them dry in between and layer them. Like if I want to paint green, if you layer the, the blue and then yellow on top or vice versa, um, you will get you'll be able to see each color individually, but still see the green. Whereas if you mix them in the palette to make green, you just get green. you get a flatter, uh, yeah. flatter color. You don't get the vibrancy of a layered color. Yeah, that would that makes sense. Cause I usually have heard a lot of watercolor uh, painters that I've talked with saying, no, no, you really, you really want to make that transition happen on the paper because that's part of the visual effect or the, the um, you know, how people fall in love basically with, with watercolor is that of, you really know you're skilled when you can, in my words, you really know you're skilled when you can do that. And I mean, I see a lot of that also in your work and that's what draws oh, my right. eye to it. You know, it is because it's, you, you just really tell the skill level that you have, Annie is, is wonderful. So. Oh, thanks. It yeah. just takes a lot of practice, you know, with yeah. oil, with any medium, um, you just have to keep doing it over and over. And one of the things I tell my students that's really important is don't hoard your supplies. Use up, buy that, go ahead and buy that set of watercolors, paints, mm -hmm. but use them up because you will not get to the next level until you used up that beginner set. If you're all, if you're just hoarding it and not working it and not, and just not working those colors and not using them, mm -hmm you're never going to get to intermediate, use them up. Yeah. And, and like you were saying, it's really important. And I can see why it's because I did the same thing with my watercolor um, markers. I mean, my first, my first little endeavor into watercolors. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I was having trouble with them trying to, to do what I want to do. And of course I'm thinking oil painting, you know, everything I learned in oil painting. Um, so I, I did make that color chart with each of the pence and just add a little bit of water down, which is totally different than using like your watercolors that you're talking about. Uh, you draw a line and then you draw the, the water, use the water to have it draw out, if you will, or gradient out or however you want to say it. Um, but it, it's just, you know, I, I don't know how you keep watercolor and oil separate <laughs> in your mind when you're painting, because uh, I've seen a lot of um, watercolor a lot of oil painters that traverse into watercolor, but you can tell it's an oil painter that's gone into watercolor and hasn't learned, uh, if you want to call it the foundations of watercolor, the foundational elements of watercolor, because it's, it looks like this. I have a painting actually downstairs from somebody who started in oil, became allergic to turpentine, and then um, 
went into watercolor, but you could tell he's using watercolors a lot like he used oils. Um, mm. So he could have possibly, like I did not see him paint this painting, but I'm imagining that he probably used a palette where he mixed all of his colors, for example, and then put it on the paper. You probably would have a better explanation of how an oil painter still paints like an oil painter with watercolor than I would since you do both of those. But I don't see that. I mean, I was totally surprised to hear that you actually paint in oil as well. So, because I would not have, looking at your watercolor, I would not have guessed that in, oh, in wow. a million worlds or a million years. So, um, I yeah. I just do the oil. I don't do it actually in the studio because I don't want to have the smell in the house. Mm -hmm. So I only do it in the plein airs and the competitions. And I really um, do it mostly in the competitions over watercolors because it's so much easier at, to, in your, when you're in a competition with watercolor, you know, you have to, you, well, in a competition, you bring your frames and you get your surface stamped in the morning, gate stamped, mm -hmm. you paint, and then you turn it in frames at the end of the day. And that's a lot easier to do with an oil painting than it is with the watercolor, because with watercolor, you have to have um, everything framed in a pristine laboratory type situation. So you don't get any dirt and dust under your glass. Right, right. Yeah. Now I have recently, um, in the last couple of years, started mounting paper on panel so that I can do watercolors on panel and then varnish them and um, put those in my plein air frames, ah, okay. like I do with the oil paintings. And I've actually, I started mounting paintings, watercolor paintings on panels a dozen years ago. I actually have a, a video online that's at least 10 years old of how to do it. Okay. Out of mount, yeah, paper on panel. Cool. But I hadn't done it with unpainted paper and then painted on it lately. Later, uh, I just started doing that for the plein air. It's, it's becoming more popular and more. Well, it's, it's it's easy, like like painting in oils. It's easier in the plein air competitions because you're not dealing with the glazing and the mats and the the whole clean room situation that you have to have with framing. Cool. So I am going to um. Thank you for all of the tips and everything. You do. I don't, do you have any other tips that you want to pass along? Cause we're coming up to kind of the end of the talk here and I could keep you here all day, but what I, I have to do is take one of your workshops. <laughs> so, so I learn how to paint. So <laughs> any other tips? Uh, nope, nope, no. I know we're out of time and gosh, that really went so, so fast. Yeah, it did. It was great. Uh, we'll have to have you back on maybe when I get really frustrated with watercolors again. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. But no, um, anytime you have something that you want to talk or, or um, discuss about watercolor painting or, or whatever, you know, drop me a note, let me know. I'd be happy to have you back on uh, oh, the I show again. Back. Yeah. And um, thanks again for being an honorary member for of Artistic Harmonies. Like, oh, my um, pleasure. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that off the ground a little bit more and, and really start talking about different things that that we can do to help the watercolor societies and um, different things like that. Uh, so for now, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Make sure that you go and visit Annie's website, AnnieStrack.com. Is that correct? Yes, okay. AnnieStrackArt.com. And, okay, AnnieStrackArt.com. And uh, also Annie is on Facebook and she is, uh, are you on? Yeah, you're on Twitter because I've been liking some of your paintings. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Annie is on uh, Facebook and is on Twitter. So please make sure that you stop by and say hi to her and uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Annie. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye-bye everybody. Let me. Bye-bye. Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.